Since we are on live stream, we have to begin exactly at 6.59. Um, so if you'll maybe get a glass of wine and some cookies or something and uh, have a seat, we'll begin in about two minutes. Good evening and welcome to the Church of St. Ignatius Loyola. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our pastor, Father Dennis Yesalona. With more ado, I'll be right back. Oh. <laughs> we are here for the third in our lecture series, Blessed are the Peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. We are delighted that some people are here for the uh, <clears throat> braving some of the rain outside. And welcome to all that are joining us via live stream. We call this the miracle of St. Ignatius that when, there's, when it, a mass begins, there seem to be very few people in the church, but within the first five minutes, it, it fills up very quickly. So, you ready? And now the pastor, Father Yatsalona. Good evening, and welcome to this year's Laetare Lecture. As you know, this lecture series began several years ago uh, when we decided to bring to the parish preeminent scholars, members of the academy, statesmen, and church leaders to reflect, uh, to bring to us their reflections on thought and thoughts on current issues of the day. We are delighted to have with us this evening Professor Kim Daniels, whom, who will be shortly and more formally introduced by Father Hilbert. But I have another reason for being here other than welcoming you, and that is, as you also may be aware, when we began this lecture series, we also decided to confer the highest honor of this parish on the person who would deliver the Laetari Lecture, the Loyola Medal. We look at that person to see if she or he manifests in his or her work all of the qualities of St. Ignatius Loyola. And we certainly have found one in this evening's presenter, Professor Kim Daniels. And so, without further ado, I have the pleasure and distinct honor of conferring the Loyola Medal this evening. In the spiritual exercises, St. Ignatius tells us that actions are to be referred to words. Ignatian leadership is an invitation to act in a way that reflects our most deeply held beliefs, affirms our vocation, and serves others, particularly those in need. Ignatian spirituality is grounded in the conviction that God is active in our world. The path laid out by Ignatius is a way of discerning God's presence in our everyday lives and doing something about it. 
Being a leader in this tradition means, as the late Superior General, Peter Hans Kolbenbach of the Society of Jesus tells us, we must be women and men marked by competence, conscience, and compassion. <clears throat> Kim Daniels is a woman with an easy smile, a brilliant intellect, and a fierce love for the church. An outstanding communicator, she was spokesperson for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. She is a member of the Vatican Dicastery for Communications. An honorable and excellent attorney, she is, rec is a recognized advocate for religious freedom. The director of the Initiative on Catholic Thought and Public Life at Georgetown University, Kim Daniels helps Catholic leaders minister in a very complex environment, building a church that lives and shares the gospel. The parish community of the Church of St. Ignatius Loyola wishes to celebrate this woman of faith in the public square, a leader distinguished by competence, conscience, and compassion. The Loyola Medal confers on you, Professor Daniels, honorary membership in the parish, and as its pastor, I have the pleasure of performing this solemn duty. And now, without further ado, Father Hilbert. So once again, good evening. I'm Father Hilbert, Associate Pastor, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all, those here gathered in Wallace Hall, and those who join via live stream, to the third in our parish lecture series for 2023. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. On behalf of Father Yesolona and our entire parish community, I am honored to introduce this evening's lecture entitled, A Better Kind of Politics, Advancing the Common Good in Challenging Times. It is not too bold to say there is a great deal of challenge in the world and times in which we live. And the question we should consider is how we Christians should respond to it. Unfortunately, it feels we have been caught in the same mire as the rest of the world. Peacemaking, many conclude, is not practical. We want to take Jesus' words seriously. If a peacemaker is to be called a child of God, then we should want to be one. To be a peacemaker, however, will take some work. The beauty of this compound word is that it matches the word peace with the word making. It is active, as Father Yesolona read in the citation. And perhaps nowhere more challenging than in the arena of public life and politics, dominated as it is by hostility and division. Here is where the richness and depth of Catholic social talk thought can offer principles and direction for peacemaking, for the benefit of all, for the common good. Our speaker this evening brings an uncommon set of gifts to the topic of the common good. Educator, advocate, consultant member of the Vatican the Castry of Communications, wife and mother. Professor Kim Daniels is director of the Initiative on Catholic Thought and Public Life at Georgetown University. And so I offer a special welcome to all the Hoyas here this evening. She builds bridges, she promotes dialogue, and prepares a new generation of leaders 
to work for the common good and the dignity of all people. After her talk, Professor Daniels will be happy to hear your questions and comments, promoting dialogue here among us. Peacemaking will not be easy, maybe not even possible. However, we are still called to seek it. We remember St. Paul's words for peacemakers. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Let's welcome now our speaker, Professor Kim Daniels. Thank you so much, Father Hilbert, for that such a kind introduction. Father Yasinova, I'm so honored and humbled to receive the Loyola Medal. Um, thank you all for your welcome here to St. Ignatius Loyola. Uh, it, I want to uh, let you know how, how excited I am to add my own contribution to the wonderful series of talks featuring so many thoughtful voices. And I'm just so glad to be here with you all tonight. We're here to talk about advancing the common good in challenging times through what Pope Francis calls a better kind of politics. I've had many roles that inform my thoughts about this complicated issue, including as a lawyer who worked on First Amendment issues, as a senior staff member at the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, and as a mom, which to be honest is likely the place that taught me the most about navigating intense disagreements about issues of profound importance. And if you've ever seen six kids try to share a bathroom on a Monday morning, you know what I'm talking about. Um, tonight, though, my reflections are largely based on my roles at Georgetown University and at the Vatican, where I've gotten an up-close opportunity to watch, listen, learn, and reflect on how our global church, as led by Pope Francis through these remarkable last 10 years, experiences what it means to live in our challenging times. And this leads me to look forward with hope to our future. At the Vatican, as a member of the Dicastery for Communications, I've helped advise church leaders on responses to clergy abuse, COVID-19, and the ongoing synod process. And if you think you have a hard job, try being an American woman whose role is to help Vatican officials understand that the way things have always been done isn't necessarily the way things should be done. At Georgetown, as the director of the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life, I've worked with my colleagues to promote principled dialogue on Catholic social thought and national and global issues in a polarized nation and church, to build bridges across political, religious, ideological, ecclesial divisions, and to encourage a new generation of Catholic leaders to see their faith as central to their lives and work. Inspired by the mission, words, and actions of Pope Francis, we believe that Catholic social teaching is essential to the promotion of human dignity and the pursuit of the common good in our very challenging context today. Over the last decade, our initiative has grown from a promising idea to a preeminent center for productive dialogue across divides. We've hosted some 150 in-person and online gatherings that have reached over 275,000 people across the country and even internationally. We once had a Q&A, a question come in from a refugee camp in Uganda, uh, which was one of our proudest moments, I think. We've helped raise the voices of women, people of color, and younger leaders, along with established figures in public and ecclesial life. So at the initiative, we just celebrated our 10th anniversary, and as it happens, our anniversary coincides with the 10th anniversary of Pope Francis' pontificate, which was two weeks ago on March 13th. I was in two very different places on March 13th, 2013, and March 13th, 2023, and I want to start by offering that story as a frame for our conversation tonight, because I think it offers some key insights into Pope Francis' efforts to move our church forward through these challenging times. So on March 13, 2013, I was in St. Peter's Square for the Papal Conclave, there to offer commentary to the media and waiting for the white smoke to rise from that chimney. I had never been to Rome before, much less observed the conclave, and my view of the church was rooted in my US experiences, and to be honest, very particular and narrow experiences at that. But that day, something began to change, I think. I saw the global Catholic church firsthand. People of all ages and nationalities, joyful, hopeful, singing, praying, 
witnessing to our faith there in St. Peter's Square, waiting to see who would step out on that balcony as our next pope. And then Cardinal Bergoglio, Pope Francis, stepped out. And most of all, I'll remember two things. First of all, all the Italians shouting, Francesco, Francesco, the name of the saint so close to their hearts and of course all of our hearts. I hope I can say that here in a Jesuit place. I don't know, the Franciscans don't let me see. Um, but secondly, soon after that, the utter, complete quiet and stillness in that once noisy square when Pope Francis asked us to bless him. You could hear the water flowing through the fountains. More than any words, that moment, all of us from many different backgrounds and perspectives, standing together in silent prayer, praying for our new Pope, spoke not only to Pope Francis' humility, but also to the great Christian truth that it's when we stand together in love that we find strength. It's in unity and love that we most effectively witness to our faith. So needless to say, the 10 years that followed that night have not too often been marked by love and unity, but instead by anger and division. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But I wanna flash forward to where I was just two weeks ago tonight, on March 13th, 2023. The small village of Tepecoyo, El Salvador, in a soup kitchen started by Angelica Portillo and her friends to serve the people of their small community, eating a meal together, listening, praying, laughing, crying together over the course of an afternoon. I was in, an, in El Salvador for a week as part of the Ignatian Colleagues Program run by the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities. It's a remarkable effort to educate and form faculty and staff more deeply in the Jesuit and Catholic tradition of higher education through learning and experiencing aspects of our Jesuit and Catholic identity, charism, tradition, and spirituality. Sitting around a long table in a tiny community in the mountains of El Salvador, enjoying the hospitality and generosity of Angelica and her family and friends, wearing dirty sneakers and jeans and a sweat-soaked t-shirt, my lunch that day was far different than the one I'd had in an Italian restaurant at St. Peter's Square exactly 10 years earlier, where I'd sat in a business suit, heels, TV-ready makeup, had antipasti and risotto and a glass of wine and talked with my journalist friends. In Tepecoya, we heard about the daily struggles and joys that our new friends experience, about their fears and their hopes for their children, about the history of injustice in the area, and about the continuing strength of St. Oscar Romero's witness. We had an experience, however brief and preliminary, of what Pope Francis calls so often the culture of encounter. One lesson Pope Francis has taught us frequently is that reality is greater than ideas, that we can learn more from everyday life than we can from encyclicals, more from accompanying those who are poor and sick and vulnerable than from ecclesial statements. Our afternoon in Tepecoyo and our week in El Salvador gave me a small window into what it means not just to speak the truth in love, but to do good with love. A window into a faith that does justice even as I know how much more I have to learn. I learned something more about Pope Francis' vision for a church with the ability to heal wounds and warm hearts of the faithful, as he says, a church of nearness and proximity. He says, I see the church as a field hospital after battle. The church's ministers must be merciful, take responsibility for the people, and accompany them like the good Samaritan who washes and cleans and raises up his neighbor. This is pure gospel, said Pope Francis at the very beginning of his pontificate. So with that frame and with those themes, broadening perspectives, looking through the lens of our global faith, the importance of unity to our witness, the importance of accompaniment and encounter and closeness and mercy at the heart of the gospel, the Good Samaritan as a parable for our times, let's now talk more specifically. I'm going to structure the rest of our conversation tonight by first looking at the very challenging context we have here in our church and in the United States. Second, I'm going to look at potential responses to these challenges, particularly through the lens of Pope Francis and his aspirations for what he calls a better kind of politics and lessons we've learned at the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought as well. And finally, I'm going to conclude with some words about our future and in particular about the Synod all things that I see as signs of hope. 
So first, our context. We are a wounded work church, and we are a hurting nation, suffering from increasing polarization within our family of faith, hostility and division in our politics, likely division within some of our own families here tonight. As I've noted in other settings, in the past few years, here's just some of what we've been through as a country and as a church. Two presidential impeachments and a violent attack on the US Capitol. Divisive US Supreme Court arguments and decisions around abortion, voting rights, immigration, the death penalty. Continued anger and anguish regarding the ongoing clergy abuse crisis. The US withdrawal from Afghanistan and the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine police killings of black Americans in our streets and on our screens, and a racial reckoning in our cities and in our hearts. And a pandemic with nearly a million lives lost here in the US alone, shutdowns, closed schools and churches, conflicts within families, neighborhoods, communities over vaccines and masks. Needless to say, it's been exhausting, sometimes demoralizing. And let's focus on one of those parts of our recent context, what Vatican leaders and many others have called the defining crisis of our generation, the COVID-19 pandemic. Think back to what it felt like three years ago this month. As the pandemic began, we saw overflowing hospital wards, healthcare personnel suited up in gear most of us had only seen on television, families hankering down in our homes and wiping down our groceries in fear of this mysterious virus, wearing masks and gloves for the first time, remember that? following news of the pandemic obsessively, wondering where this was all going to go and when it was going to end. Two weeks, two months, two years. Pope Francis has sometimes been described as the world's pastor, and three years ago today, on March 27, 2020, he lived up to that title. To me, it will be remembered as one of the iconic images of Francis's papacy. Here he was, the 84-year-old leader of some 1.3 billion Catholics around the world, standing alone at night in St. Peter's Square. Remember that? In the steady reign of a deserted St. Peter's with the great basilica behind him and Bernini's colonnade around him, an ancient icon of Mary and a miraculous crucifix by his side. That cold night, he delivered an extraordinary Irby and Orby at Orby address to the church and the world in response to the coronavirus pandemic. He said that we have realized that we're all on the same boat, all of us fragile and disoriented, but at the same time important and needed. On this boat are all of us, just like those disciples who spoke anxiously with one voice saying, we are perishing. So too, Pope, Pope Francis said, we have realized that we cannot go on thinking about ourselves, but only together can we do this. Before he gave his blessing, the Holy Father again reminded us that we must go forward together, unafraid. He called for new forms of hospitality, fraternity, and solidarity, and said that the Lord asks us, in the midst of our tempest, invites us to reawaken and put into practice the solidarity and hope capable of giving strength support and meaning to these hours when everything seems to be floundering. That powerful call to solidarity rang out in a frightened world and a church rent by division and soon facing several crises all at once. The COVID-19 crisis, which would develop into a medical, social, economic crisis, revealed many underlying problems, including an economy that leaves too many behind, a crisis of solidarity, and a national reckoning on racism as well as a fear of this mysterious virus. Our own current context also includes a deeply polarized, politicized environment, so polarized, in fact, that our democracy is contested by this violent attack on our capital by those who refuse to, to accept the results of the last election. This polarization is part of what keeps too many from taking steps to work together in public life to pursue shared goals. I don't have to tell you that our current political and social environment is hostile, and divisive and tribal and toxic. There are so many causes for this and we could have a whole semester course, years course, dissertation on what they are. Globalization, the loss of trust in institutions, leadership failures, weakening of community ties, people feeling left out and left behind, social media and the omnipresence of technology generally. 
as I've said before, another crisis that we face is the polarization in our politics has long ago crossed over into our own church, into Catholic life. It divides our community and it weakens the Catholic contribution to the public good. Powerful voices with an attachment to the ecclesial, political, and economic status quo have challenged and sought to undermine Pope Francis and his mission and message. And of course, this is all taking place in the context of a broad and deep loss of trust in institutions generally. To take one example, in April 2019, the Pew Research Center found that only 17% of Americans trust the government in Washington to do, do what is right always or most of the time, 17%. And meanwhile, of course, the clergy abuse crisis and the leadership crisis that enabled it have further weakened the credibility of the church in public life and led to what Pope Francis has called a crisis of credibility in the US church. With the clergy sexual abuse crisis involving horrific acts of abuse on a large scale, which were covered up by previously trusted leaders occurring in this polarized context, it's no wonder, no surprise, to find widespread and continued anger, anguish, and alienation from the institutional church among lay Catholics. Many lay Catholics are demoralized, tempted to pick an ecclesial faction and sign up for one side of a battle, even to leave the church. Those who remain struggle over their inability to pass down our Catholic faith and active participation in the life of the church to our children and grandchildren, who unsurprisingly see in these grave moral failures an institution that has lost much of its credibility and moral authority. And finally, our hostile and divisive media context only intensifies these many challenges. Social media and a relentless news cycle heighten the sense of constant crisis, erode trust, undermine authority, and deepen polarization. Division, tension, information overload are so pervasive and overwhelming that efforts to advance views about church teachings are too often distorted or dismissed or just drowned out. And as journalist Emma Green argues, our focus on large abstract issues over the local in particular adds to our loss of meaning and community and connection. So this has been a really bleak and demoralizing context that I've just laid out for you. And I'm sorry to start that way, but it's important to be truthful. So why bother should we ask ourselves? Why not just avoid all this mess focus on living out our faith in our personal lives, stay out of politics, and keep church institutions out of politics too. Because the gospel calls us to do otherwise. It calls us to serve the voiceless and vulnerable. And that's a social mission. We are not a faith of quietism and retreat. One of the most countercultural things that the church teaches is that politics is a good thing, a noble calling. That engagement in public life is our responsibility and central to our mission, even in challenging times. We're not called to succeed. We're not called to achieve. We're not called to win. We're called to witness to the gospel. And this is never more important than in divisive times such as our own. As St. Oscar Romero said in remarks delivered at the University of Louvain weeks before his assassination in 1980, he was learning the beautiful but harsh truth that the Christian faith does not cut us off from the world, but immerses us in it. That the church is not a fortress set apart from the city. In fact, Catholic engagement in public life is robust and complicated and important. It's local and it's national and it's global. It's institutions, it's popular movements, it's communities, it's families and it's 1.3 billion diverse persons united by a shared faith that does justice. And it's central to living out that faith. So what might an effective Catholic engagement in public life look like in these challenging and polarized times? What does it mean to practice a better kind of politics? Well, let's take the broad view to start, looking at the powerful words and humble witness of Pope Francis, who reminds us that we're called to live out sincere, daily, humble, and generous service to all but especially to those dearest to the Lord's heart. And that solidarity is at the heart of our mission. We are not solitary pilgrims, he says over and over again. If one member suffers, all suffer together. Pope Francis is focused on these themes of solidarity and service to those dearest to the Lord's heart, as he says, the poor, throughout his pontificate, from Evangelii Gaudium, which some have called the blueprint for his papacy, to the extraordinary March 27, 2020 Urbi at Urbi address that I noted earlier, when he stood alone in St. Peter's Square, to Fratelli Tutti 
um, his encyclical, so powerful, calling for renewal of shared principles of fraternity and solidarity as a response to these challenges. From the beginning, Pope Francis had a distinct understanding of how God is called to live, calling us to live out our mission today by looking outward, not inward, as a poor church for the poor, committed to the most vulnerable among us, from those who live in poverty, to migrants, to the unborn, to the elderly, and all those lying wounded by the roadside. Over the last 10 years, he's advanced that vision as a pastor and as a leader of our global church through his closeness to those in need, his words and actions, and his travels, like his recent trip to the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan. To practice a better kind of politics and more effectively engage in public life, he calls on church leaders and Catholics more generally to avoid the twin temptations, on the one hand, retreating from public life altogether, or on the other, approaching public life as a battle when we're on one side, a culture war. As the Jesuit Conference of Canada and the US 2018 statement, Protecting the Least Among Us says, a political context such as ours offers many temptations to avoid. One is the retreat from a corrupt world, preserving an illusion of moral purity. The second is moral relativism, which is another kind of retreat. Relativism advances the false claim that multiple conflicting positions about human existence can all be accepted as correct. The great American Jesuit theologian John Courtney Murray suggests a process where we retreat neither from the world nor from the truth. Instead, we engage those who initially disagree with us, seek to create an acceptable consensus, and while continuing to persuade and educate those who disagree with our convictions. This is proposing rather than imposing, and we believe it is the only way to create sustained change, said Murray. In other words, we can engage and try to persuade those who disagree with us. We can seek dialogue, we can collaborate with those where we agree, participate in dialogue where we can engage, and respectfully disagree where we must. Those are general lessons I've drawn from watching this pontificate over the past 10 years. But we can also follow his example by enlarging our own perspectives to more fully appreciate the global nature of our church. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Catholic Church was a mostly European institution of several hundred million souls. As John McGreevy, a leading historian of Catholicism and the provost at the University of Notre Dame, has noted in his wonderful recent book, Catholicism, A Global History, today we are the world's most multilingual and multicultural institution, a church of 1.3 billion people in, around the globe. And of those 1.3 billion Catholics, only some 6% live here in the United States, 6%. If our perspective is limited to our own experience here in the U.S., we won't have a full understanding of how God is calling us to live out our mission today. The Catholic Church's global presence as a unified yet diverse network is a strong counter witness to polarization. As McGreevy says, the Church's unified presence in diverse cultures and, and countries around the globe, both physically and through its institutions, ministries, religious and lay faithful, offers an important counter witness to the polarization increasingly heightened by the media. By broadening our own perspective, we can look beyond the divisions and the strident voices that too often occupy us here in the United States to focus on what we can learn from our brothers and sisters living out the gospel around the world. A wider lens can help overcome division by diluting it. As McGreevy notes, perhaps some of the divisions among Catholics, especially here in the US, will dissipate less because of unanticipated resolutions and more because the world and the church will have moved on. A new generation may place more emphasis on Pope Francis' call to be citizens of our respective nations and of the entire world, builders of a new social bond. And now I'd like to focus on Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis' most sustained contribution to the idea of a better kind of politics. Here Francis offers a vision of renewal rooted in social and political charity, again, expressed in how we treat our neighbors lying wounded by the roadside. Fratelli Tutti is a reflection on how the, world, the church is to be in the world today. The answer, not a fortress, but a home with open doors. We are called to put the gospel mission at the center of our lives and our communities. Engagement in public life is central to that mission and never more so than in times like our own. Along with Evangelii Gaudium and Laudato Si, Fratelli Tutti completes a triptych of Pope Francis' most important contributions to Catholic social thought. In each, he looks outward, not inward. 
He, ra he sees us as part of an interconnected world and as part of one human family. In each, he raises up the poor, the marginalized, and the least of these. And in each, each the answer to the question of what then shall we do is mercy and accompaniment and encounter and dialogue with those who disagree with us. The interpretive key to Fratelli Tutti is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Pope Francis reminds us that in response to the question, who is my neighbor, Jesus offers an expansive answer, everyone. And what does it mean to be a neighbor? To treat others with mercy, especially those lying wounded by the roadside again. As Francis writes, the decision to include or exclude can serve as a criterion for judging every economic and political and social and religious project. Those who are poor and vulnerable, those who live with disabilities or discrimination, immigrants and refugees and all those in need are not issues or problems, but sisters and brothers, part of our one human family. This turn towards political charity is key to the renewal of our politics. Pope Francis calls on Catholics to renew the church's voice in public life by focusing on service to those in need, to see ourselves as a wholly faithful people of God, and a church of a relationship that looks outward, not inward, and welcomes, creates community, and stands in solidarity. Um, Pope Francis calls us to know that politics is something more noble than posturing, more noble than marketing and media spin. These show nothing but division, conflict, and oblique cynicism, he says. As time goes on, reflecting on the past, the questions will not be, he reminds us, how many people endorsed me, how many voted for me, how many had a positive image of me. The real and potentially painful questions for politicians and all of those who engage in public life will be, how much love did I put into my work? What did I do for the progress of our people? What mark did I leave on the life of society? What real bonds did I create? What positive forces did I unleash? And how much social peace did I sow? His words are a call for conversion, and our engagement should be about mission, about the gospel, and about building social peace. This is our responsibility here in this room and no one else's. As the Latin American bishop said at Medellin, peace is not found, it is built. The Christian is the artisan of peace. Now finally, our work at the initiative has taught us some lessons, practical lessons, about how to help overcome polarization and focus together on the beliefs we share and on the common good, lessons that we often share with others. First, we've learned to overcome division and build relationships of trust. It's crucial to keep the, our Catholic and gospel mission and focus on service to the voiceless and vulnerable front and center. For that's what remind, unites us as Catholics. As Pope Francis frequently reminds us, the church isn't just another NGO. At the initiative, we look outward, not inward, raising up the day-to-day, -day, on the ground service of Catholics living out the gospel in our local communities and around the world, um, who focus on the beliefs we share and the people we're called to serve, rather than focusing on ourselves and our tired internal disagreements. At the initiative, we seek to be political but not partisan. I teach a class on Pope Francis, Catholic social thought and public life, and almost every one of my students comes in thinking of the church as a partisan institution, at the, as the Republican Party at prayer, frankly. By the end of sem the semester, they've hopefully learned that Catholics don't fit easily within either major political party here in the United States, and that effective political participation means challenging both sides. It means having our faith drive our politics and not letting our politics drive our faith. Building friendships and community in person through face-to-face -face engagement and encounter is also critical to help soften the hostility and division that wound our Catholic communities. As Father Aaron Westman notes in his masterful new book, The Church's Mission in a Polarized World, when people cross over and encounter each other, especially when it's done person to person, people are often reminded that there are more than ideas at stake within the polarized hurricanes of the American context. We also see strong efforts toward authentic, principled dialogue as crucial. Dialogue itself has impact. It's a model for others. It's an act of resistance against our current hostile divisiveness. Too often people reflexively dismiss dialogue as cover for least common denominator Catholicism or a mushy middle ground. But real dialogue is the exact opposite of that. 
It means holding to principles while listening and learning from others. It means working for unity by focusing on the beliefs we share and the people we're called to serve rather than ourselves. The alternative is staying in our own echo chambers where hostility and divisiveness live. We've learned that diversity is an obligation, not an option. We've learned to lift up the leadership of the voices of women, people of color, and young leaders, all of whom bring different perspectives, energy, and effectiveness to the conversation than what's usually heard. We've also learned to listen. When our initiative held a dialogue on how to recover a sense of the common good in our divided church and nation, Vincent Rougeau, the president of the College of the Holy Cross, highlighted the importance of listening to those different from us as central to building a shared sense of the common good. Listening well to others is integral to an Ignatian spirituality and it's integral to Pope Francis' mission and culture of encounter. And finally, we've learned that the principles of Catholic social thought provide a moral framework and vocabulary for assessment, analysis, and action that helps bring people together in recognition of their responsibility to serve the common good and the poor and vulnerable in particular. As columnist David Brooks said at one of our dialogues, Catholic social teaching is the most coherent philosophy that opposes rampant individualism and should be relied on especially now. Why is Catholic social thinking Catholic, he asked? I think it's in part a belief in a triune God. In order to achieve unity with Christ, you have to achieve unity with the people that Christ gave himself for. And so there's just built into the faith and into the church a more communal and interdependent ethos. Catholic social thought offers a moral and intellectual architecture for resisting this erroneous autonomy and what Pope Francis has called the throwaway culture, instead providing tools for renewing community and solidarity in the face of isolation and division. It offers principles like respect for human life and dignity, solidarity, and the common good that sound in other faiths as well. It offers languages and tools for renewing community and solidarity, and it rests on the equal dignity of all as made in the image and likeness of God, no matter how weak or vulnerable or voiceless. Pope Francis is shaping Catholic social thought in a way that particularly resonates with others. He focuses on service and a poor church to the poor, on accompanying those who are pushed to the margins, and accompanying those who suffer from our economy of exclusion. He also emphasizes that the sacraments and service to the poor and vulnerable are what unite us. So looking ahead, Synod 2021-24 stands as a hopeful path for revived communion. The Synod is a global listening process open to everyone and aimed at lifting up the voices of lay people and renewing our ability to live out our mission in our own particular time and place. It's a mission centered most of all on Humbert's humble service to others. The Synod offers a model for praying together, for listening together, for learning together, and for moving forward together in order to better live our mission to love God and our neighbors. The U.S. Church took an important step forward with the diocesan phase of the Synod, a more than eight month long listening process that included over 30,000 opportunities to participate concluding in a national synthesis report reflecting contributions from all 178 Latin dioceses in the U.S. and some 700,000 participants. The synthesis began by focusing on certain enduring wounds for the U.S. church, and I've already named some of them. It's noted that these wounds have led to a lack of trust in the hierarchy, a loss of a sense of belonging and connectedness, isolation and loneliness, and pain and anxiety. One source of division and grave scandal among many of the regional syntheses was the perceived lack of unity among U.S. bishops and even some of the individual bishops with the Holy Father, people noted. The report then highlighted the common longings for enhanced communion and participation that we all feel, an enriched sacramental life focused on the Eucharist, a desire for a more welcoming church where all members of the people of God can find accompaniment on the journey, including LBGTQ individuals, divorced people, women, people with special needs, and those suffering from racism. Another common hope was, in the report's words, a desire for ongoing formation for mission, as well as an increased understanding of Catholic social thought. So as a member of the Synod Communications Commission, I've had the opportunity to see this effort up close. And while it can be complicated and at times messy, it's a remarkable sign of hope that is planting seeds of renewal and a reminder that we're all on a pilgrimage together. So as we wrap up here today, we should step back and remember that we need to take the long view. 
that in Pope Francis' words, God sees into the distance. God is not in a hurry. I want to emphasize two of the lessons that we've discussed. First, that we in the United States are just one small part of an incredibly diverse and vital and large global family of faith. And second, that during these challenging times, Pope Francis has shown us how to effectively advance Catholic teachings in public life. He focuses on our mission of solidarity with the poor and vulnerable, and he centers the gospel in Catholic social teaching. He's shown us how to act. He works to engage and persuade, even when it's difficult. He keeps the focus outward on mission, not inward. And he talks not of marketing and strategizing, but of the beating heart of the gospel. I'm always heartened to remember that around the country and the world, right now, every day the sacraments are being celebrated in Catholic churches, children are being taught in Catholic schools, the hungry are being fed through Catholic social service ministry, and the sick are being cared for in Catholic hospitals. That's our mission as Catholics. And focusing on that mission, love of God and love of neighbor, um, celebrating the sacraments, serving those in need, will keep us together, reminding us that we are the church. We're all in this together, and we're called to renew and rebuild. It's up to us. As St. Oscar Romero said in his final homily, I ask all of you, dear brothers and sisters, to view these things that are happening now in our historical moment with a spirit of hope and generosity and sacrifice. And let us do what, he can, what we can, he said. We can all do something and be more understanding. His final homily. Now more than ever, we're called to be builders of bridges and artisans of peace, to listen with open hearts and minds to each other, especially those who have too often been excluded. And most of all, to do what we can in a spirit of hope, generosity, and sacrifice. Thank you. Hope, hope, generosity, and sacrifice. Thank you, Kim, for that inspiring talk, referring to Pope Francis, but also to John Courtney Murray and uh, other, other eminent Catholics. Um, you have really touched us, I think. The beyond what John Courtney Murray said, we retreat neither from the world nor from truth but that idea of opening up to the world. And I think that is so key to the Ignatian charism. Ignatius didn't want Jesuits to be behind monastic walls. He wanted them to be out in the world, not afraid of the world, not having that fortress mentality, but, but being there with the people. And the parable of the Good Samaritan is just the most wonderful teaching that we can, that we can have. Professor Daniels is opening up for questions, comments. I'd ask you to please stand and give us your name and then present your question or your comment. Also, the bar is open <laughs> if you want to get a glass of wine or some, some cookies. That's... <coughs> I'm not sure I'm as hopeful as you. I mean, as long as the church uh, continues to articulate uh, that marriage is between a man and a woman and, and people should be characterized based on their birth gender and uh, it's incumbent on every Catholic politician and every Catholic to not vote for anyone who is uh, who would vote for uh, any legislation to support abortion. Uh, those things can't be dialogued away, no matter how you define dialogue. Um, uh, so it's, I think, in terms of polarization, the church, at least in the United States, all 6% of it, um, is uh, the church creates and is continuing to create division, and I don't see that changing. Um, and so, you know, maybe the German bishops are going to be, you know, lead the way through the synod, but you know, or they're going to be squashed by Francis, you know, who we all laud as the person we've been waiting for uh, lo these many years. But even he, too, wants the church to move as a, as a totality. 
and with the growth in all of the Catholics in Africa, um, I don't see when that's going to happen. So um, it's, uh, I'm sorry to be so negative. I mean, um, so you ended up on an up note, but I uh, honestly, I just don't see it. So first of all, is that better? Can everybody hear me? So first of all, I mean, I take your point in that I think I tried to set the context at the beginning. We have a very, we have a very challenging context right now. A and part of, of approaching that context to change it, right, again, is broadening our view beyond here in the United States. But you point to issues that are, that are very challenging. But I have to say that I think that, I still think that dialogue is part of the answer there. And I think that if you take one example that you talked about, LGBT issues, right? I think the place that conversation is today is a different place than it was 20 years ago. And that's not just in the church, but that's bro more broadly in the country. And a lot of that has to do with people's public witness around it. It has to do with debate and dialogue and discussion. Uh, but most of all, I'll say this in my mind, and I'm no expert on these issues, but it has to do with encounter. It has to do with people knowing people, right? It has to do with people coming to know people in their lives and learning to see the people in front of them. And I recognize that our church changes slowly. If, th if you're looking for change, that it changes slowly. To be honest, I think that's a strength. I think that uh, in many ways, right? So in other words, we have this radical Christian message 2,000 years ago by an itinerant preacher in a backwater district of the Roman Empire. And somehow that radical message has carried forward over the course of 2,000 years to where we're sitting here in New York City in 2023 talking about that message tonight. And we're streaming it out to people well beyond this room. And to me, that's remarkable. And part of preserving that message has been the institutional church, right? And some, that's part of why we're Catholics, is that we say that this, maybe not, but, but this institution has managed to, in some way, and however imperfectly, and however much we've failed and engaged in, as I pointed out with the abuse crisis, great evil at times, and all of the rest, somehow, the church has managed to carry forth that gospel message. And so I'm hopeful that even though change comes slowly, sometimes change comes. Um, I think, for instance, let's take another hard question you talked about, and that's abortion. I think we just had the Dobbs issue. We had a dialogue, we had the Dobbs decision. Um, and you know, the church carries forward in our hearts that, that all the voiceless and vulnerable are protected. And that's both the unborn, but it's also the, the, wa it's also the mother. And the woman has to be at a center of this conversation, the mother in, the in a mother in a way that she has not been in our U.S. church at all um, too many times. We had a dialogue right after the Dobbs decision came down where we had Catholic women talking from a variety of perspectives on this and bringing their perspectives to the conversation from the point of view of a Catholic, uh, from a Catholic point of view. So we had Erica Bakayoki and we had Molly O'Reilly from Commonweal all talking about the conversation. Did we change the world? No, but it was a small step forward in advancing understanding among people who disagreed on the issue. And I think what you're seeing in the wake of Dobbs, frankly, is in the U.S. church, you're seeing a lot of culture war voices still, and you've heard that I disagree with that approach. I don't think that's a way to move things forward, that kind of language and vocabulary and approach to the world as if we're in an embattled fortress. Um, but what you have also seen is the U.S. bishops coming forward with, a pr in October, a, a raft of policies recommending how do we support women and children in need? How do we have, what kind of policies can we recommend at the state and national level? Well, should they have been doing this a long time ago more vocally? Yes. Do they do it at state levels and Catholic conferences and others really well sometimes? Yes. But it's that advocacy now for policies that support women and children in need that to me should be our leading foot forward on all of these issues. So I recognize your story for sure. I think the Synod is a really hopeful process about uh, in regard to this. And I think that'll be slow too and we're not gonna see, you know, it's not about achieving some direct result tomorrow, um, but it is to me a chance for involving lay voices and more voices and more diverse voices and I think that can only be a step forward. But thank you for your question because it's a, an important one. Hi, 
Hi, uh, my name is Paul Capetillo. Thank you so much for your talk, really enjoyed it. And uh, my question was on one of the issues you mentioned. Sorry, you mentioned one of the issues was the pervasiveness of technology yeah. and the role of social media. Uh, many times these platforms that are incentivized to drive division, to drive you know more engagement and um, it can feel like a, a lot for, for us to come up against, but I'm wondering if you or the initiative have a point of view on how uh, Catholics can engage in these platforms or where there's reasons for hope about how we can you know, have a more productive role with these platforms in our society that just are an all-pervasive force, force, especially with young people. Sure. Uh, the question is about social media and technology, and we all recognize that as a divisive force. And how, you know, how do we respond to that as Catholics? Is there a particularly Catholic way to respond? Um, we have had these discussions uh, at the Initiative of Dialogue, particularly with young people on social media, because it's obviously it, one, one negative part of it is the, the division and intensification of division that social media and technology can drive. But it also drives a lack of a sense of belonging and isolation, and it, it drives, uh, it's an element of what Pope Francis would call a technocratic mentality, right, where our lives are ruled by these devices. So there are lots of issues surrounding it. Um, so what do we do? I think that there are different questions personally. We don't have an official policy, and this is just Kim Daniels talking now, but, but I would say, I think there are personally uh, things we need to do, I think, in terms of limiting our own use and limiting the way we engage on social media personally. Um, and I think the, the answer there is be who you are and be that well, right? St. Francis de Sales, I think that we be our best selves on social media engages if we were in person with the person in front of us, limit our time on it, you know, all of the things, the common sense things that we know about how to make sure that that does not, that pretend community doesn't um, become a real community. Um, so I wanna say that personally, but I think the problem is broader and calls for, I think it calls for serious thinking about uh, how we come together as a community and engage around those issues. And I'm no expert on that, but I think those conversations are really worth having. I do wanna say that I think it's a sign, there are places where it's important, right? I mean, there are places where the ability to connect with people outside of your own community um, is very helpful, is a source of strength, is a source of connection. Um, and I talk back, think back to the Synod, when the Amazon Synod uh, happened, um, the way that they drew input from people around the Amazon Basin was through digital connectivity. So they were able to get a lot more input than they otherwise would have had. In the Synod process now, there's something called the Digital Synod, um, and it's not the same, right? We've talked about how face-to-face -face encounter is really important and really what encounter means, right? That's what helps when you're face-to-face -face with a real person in front of you, it's different. But second best, we don't see, it, it can be a second best alternative. So young people aren't gonna come to a Synod Lina's listening session in your parish by and large, right? I mean, and we wanna reach people, we wanna reach everybody. And so um, some folks at the Vatican said, well, you know, one way to do this is to think of a creative way of reaching people digitally. And again, it's imperfect and it's messy and did it work? But it, it was a way to reach a lot of young people, several million young people around the world to get their perspective on what's life-giving about the church, um, what is a sign of hope about the church, and what breaks your heart about the church? Three questions, right? And, and so it's a place for encounter, but I think a place where we need to be very, very careful as well. My name is Gilbert. Okay. Uh, one question that I have, we have a problem with priests. We don't have enough. Mm -hmm. We've been losing them. I don't hear any discussion in the Vatican about marriage and the priest. And I think it's about time that we go back and stop thinking about Augustine and, and go back and say, we have a problem. We have to do something about it. We have so many women who are talented. Why can we accept women as ministers, as priests? I mean, it just, it, it, it bothers me when he first became Pope, mm -hmm. because he was a Jesuit. I got so excited. I said, he is going to make a difference 
because he's going to really shake up the church. He hasn't. I'm very disappointed. He has not really pushed back against the courier. So I would have to, I, so I take your point and I'm glad you raised it because it's a question a lot of people had. In these synod conversations I mentioned, these were two issues that people brought up again and again and again. So it's not a matter of retreating from these kinds of difficult questions, right? I would have to disagree with you about the fact that Pope Francis hasn't made any steps forward um, in terms of engagement, in terms of the hope you felt about issues that were important to you at the beginning. Um, I would just say that I think Pope Francis has taken, st I'll, let's go back to the Amazon Synod for a second. They did talk about, in other words, that was a vital issue there at the Synod of the Amazon when people came together to talk about how do we serve this region? Like what are people in this region saying? These were issues that were brought up then for sure. They were talked about and Pope Francis didn't feel like there was a kind of consensus ready to make this something that would be accepted. Um, so he determined not to move forward on several issues. Um, that was a matter of his discernment, and, uh, and I don't question, I mean, I, you know, I understand that that might be challenging for some. For me, I, I look back to this church that's making steps uh, in different directions, and I think that that, um, that discussion happened. We hear a lot more about women deacons today. I, I recognize, as a woman, by the way, who's worked in, in you know, sort of Vatican circles uh, for the last seven years, you know, I understand that there's a long way to go, and even before we get to questions of women's ordination, to questions like that, um, that have theological complexities. There's just so much running room for women to be in leadership positions in the church. There's so many places where women should be. Um, half of our church's gifts are being left on the sidelines too often. And there are women in great leadership roles, heading Catholic charities, Catholic Health Association, and you know, all our social service ministries, and of course our religious sisters, and so many women in the church have leadership roles but there's so much more that can be done. Francis is making small steps forward for sure. Many, many more women have been appointed. Predicate Evangelium, the latest apostolic constitution, um, offers positions that are now open for lay people and therefore women. So lots of very important steps forward, but I understand your impatience and, uh, and all I can say is I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful as someone who's seen, we were talking at dinner earlier. When I started at the, at the Dicastery for Communication, um, I was one of three lay, about, I guess it's about six or seven years ago now, I was one of three lay people as members of this dicastery, so the rest were bishops and cardinals, and there were three lay people, one man and two women, um, and that experience in a room full of, you know, maybe 15 people, where there were three lay people, two women at the end of the table, felt very, it felt like I was part of a different century, frankly, right? For me as a professional woman here in the United States, that was a different experience for me. Um, Flash forward to now, um, the Dicastery for Communication is led by professional lay people who have had experience in communications and in budgeting and in human resources and all of those things that, that matter to running a large global organization. Um, the membership of the Dicastery, sort of, you know, think of it like a board, um, is now has some 30 lay people as consultants, and to have that many lay people in a room um, who are all accomplished professionals in their own right mean that the changing the conversation has just changed dramatically. The vitality of the conversation, the input that comes in. Um, so I've seen it change, but I, I recognize that for people, for many people those changes are too slow. Um, but that's where I am on it. Father Yesalona. Thank you, Kim, for broadening our understanding of the issues of the day, what's needed to address them. Question that I have for your thoughts, please. I can appreciate taking the long view, the, the uh, necessity and the, uh, the value of having dialogue and encounter. In the old days, we would say they're going at a glacial pace. These days, I wouldn't use that analogy at all because the glaciers are disappearing <laughs> rapidly. <laughs> However, there is an immediacy to what needs to be done. Otherwise, polarization, particularly in the political realm, will result in, I think, the loss of democracy. Mm -hmm. If we don't address other kinds of issues like the climate, we're self-destructing. 
So I can understand that there's a hopeful future by the ways in which we try to live our lives faithful to the gospel message. Right. I'm all for it, and I'm behind it. But what are your thoughts when you look at where we're at now and that there's no such thing as glacial changes, that there has to be an immediate impact? Otherwise, things seem to me to be getting more dire and dark. So again, I would say I would go to that uh, what what Oscar Romero said at the very end. It's on each one of us. We're each one of us called to do what we can where we are, okay? So it's not about, we, I, when we were down there um, in El Salvador, we met with, with Rick Jones, who has been with Catholic, Catholic Relief Services for I think some 30 years in the country. Um, no longer with Catholic Relief Services, but had been you know, doing this work. And he said something, he said, there's no winning in El Salvador, there's no achieving. You know, you don't, that's not what it's about. Like, it's just day to day and you do what you can. And I know that p for people in that experience, right, serving people who are living in dire poverty, the situation is always dire. In other words, it's never a glacial, it's the sort of the kind of words I'm saying about, you know, should the injustice, you know, how do we get rid of this systematic injustice, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's unsatisfying as well. But what I took from that experience was the people who are actually living out the gospel there said, what we're doing day to day, living out the gospel here, serving the poor, that's what we're called to do, that's where we find joy, that's where we take steps towards the culture of encounter and the growth of the gospel that we can have. So things like climate change and democracy, let's talk about that. So for me, what I do um, in my small little lane is that I run a program where we try with my colleagues we try to talk about these issues and bring together people who disagree, or when we are about an issue where we have guardrails around it. So I don't, you know, if we have a rule that uh, you have to believe that Pope Francis is Pope and that Joe Biden is the president, <laughs> we're going to have you on a, on a dialogue, um, an informal rule. And, uh, but we talked, we had a dialogue on uh, U.S. Catholics and threats to democracy uh, a month ago. And we had a serious, serious conversation about the very real challenges we faced in the past several years, and our responsibility as Catholics to respond to them. We have dialogues about climate change where we say, how do we engage with people who don't believe this? Um, how do we have that conversation and move the ball forward? I don't look for a, our little efforts to, to change, change the world, but I do look at them as part of what we're called to do in our own times and places, and I think that's the best we can ask for. Smith, can you hear me? Sure. And I don't know if you can really address this, if you have the wherewithal to address this or not, but I was thinking you've been to these various places and you've dealt with the, uh, I forget what you called it, the Amazon's Synod, was yep. that it? And my question really is, if you have 1.3 billion Catholics who are not just concerned with other Catholics, but with the world situation, right? Um, and where the church is growing, it's not really growing in the United States compared to other places. It's in South America, it seems to me, where the church is really growing, and you'd probably know better than I do where the actual places are. What I'm wondering is, if there are these regional groupings where people do give their input, people in the church, regular people, what do people say? And does one area have a complete different set of concerns because of war and their sure. economics and all this other kind of stuff than another area. And where does that leave a world government of a church? In other words, if all politics is local, isn't all religion local too, in a way? It's a great question. And that's, uh, let me talk a little bit more about this. And it gives me a chance to talk a little bit more about this synod process that we're talking about, which I think is rooted in your locality, rooted in your particular places, all of our particular places, in a church with a global vision. And so the way the process works is that it, you have, the idea is to bring the input of local communities to the Vatican, to a group, uh, a meeting, not just of bishops, but of lay people and others, um, to talk about what were the common concerns, what broke people's hearts, um, what gave them hope, uh, where did they find joy in the church, um, both Catholics, people who've left the church, people who are not Catholic, et cetera. Bring all those voices in some way, synthesize them and bring them up and then draw them together, send them back, have that kind of dialogic conversation. And so a couple things that are interesting has happened. Um, first of all, across 
all the continents, right, across all the countries, you had some common themes emerge. And I'll say what I've said earlier, which is that the two things that really bring people, despite divisions, the things that bring people together are service to the poor and vulnerable. We had Sister Norma Pimentel from the Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley with us a few weeks ago. And you know, she says there's no polarization at the border. Of course, it's a very polarized issue, but what she means is when I'm faced with a person suffering, um, I'm, I'm working with Border Patrol, they're working with me, we're trying to solve this immediate problem in front of us here. Um, so people found unity in service, direct service, and they also found unity and hope in the sacraments around the world, everybody in the sacraments, in being together as a community in, in the Eucharist. Um, but there were also other issues that unified people. There's a, a, across the continents, people wim thought women should have more leadership roles in the church, um, thought that women's voices weren't heard as much, thought we should be listening to young people, felt heartbroken that young people were le leaving the church, right? So there are these commonalities. And so part of what this report that the Vatican, sort of this group of synthesizers pulled together, who, which included uh, diverse people from every continent, religious women, um, women theologians, uh, priests, uh, you know, just lay people, all, all people from, from around the world, um, helped synthesize this and then sent it back. And now that report goes back to local communities and we reflect on it again. And the last thing I'll say about this synod process, because I encourage you to get involved in it if you can, it starts in parishes, but many people aren't, they don't want to go to a parish, right? They've had a bad, think about if you're a victim of clergy abuse, right? You don't want to, you might not want to go to your parish and do this, but you might have a lot of feedback you want to give to the church because it's still a place that's home for you um, in some way. And so there were avenues where you could offer that kind of feedback outside of a parish environment. Um, there are accepted group, different kinds of groups came together and provided their own feedback. So lots of avenues to provide this. It's not perfect, it's a, it's a messy process, but it's raising up the voices of lay people. Um, it brings those voices to Rome in a way that hasn't happened before. And to my mind, it's opened a process of listening, the first global listening session, listening process ever. I mean, something that's very much rooted in tradition, but something that's very new as well, is happening in our church. That's an exciting thing. That's something that is a change. That's something that I think will help move us forward in having a church that's more focused on this mission to the service and service to the poor and vulnerable. Good, I thank you. I hope it's, I hope it's heartening, it's heartening for me too. Sure. Sorry. Thank you. Um, one of the things that the church does, and I know the Pope raised this issue and tried to do something about it at the beginning of his term, uh, was throwing out people who get divorced. We're the only religion that does it. I had a young Orthodox Jewish girl come to me a year after she got married about getting a divorce. Um, it just it amazes me, and I know the Pope agrees with me, or he wouldn't have brought it up in the first place. So any church that's busy throwing people out rather than having them contribute to the world, I think it's a big problem. Well, and as you mentioned, you know, and so Pope Francis had um, a, another major, you know, sort of major document called the Morris Letitia, where he focused on marriage and family, and in particular, the issue you're talking about, as you've mentioned, was a centerpiece of it, right? So how do we, talked about not being a fortress, but a home with open doors. Um, but people who have been through the annulment process, people who have been divorced and remarried, want to have, I mean, don't feel that home with open doors, as you've mentioned, right? It dumps, the church feels very different uh, to them. And so this process, it was a synod on the family. Again, it was early on in his p pontificate where it happened over the course of a couple of years, coming together and talking about these issues and saying, are there places where our theological concerns can be matched with a pastoral sensibility? Um, and where that pastoral sensibility can inform how this is lived out. Those are very particular questions that I'm not an expert in, but I will say that that conversation did move forward and whether it's being lived at the time, as you mentioned, and whether it's being lived out perfectly or imperfectly locally, is a challenge, right? And it's, but it's something to raise because I, I couldn't agree more that we need to find a, a way to combine 
a pastoral sensibility there, and I think that's what Pope Francis was trying to do. With that, Kim, we give you our great respect and our great thanks for this wonderful Thank you. presentation. Thanks very much for having me.